And if there's any reason you don't want that, your questions or comments to be recorded, just so you know, it is being recorded. So welcome to Jeff Burke to the Cook Memorial Library tonight. Thanks, Jeff. Thank you. As um, Amy um, mentioned, um, I've been a boat builder for uh, 40 years now. And my specialty has been all wood boats under 20 feet. And I started off uh, building canoes and I uh, continue to um, build boats, although I'm kind of morphing into retirement. And um, I've always been really fascinated by uh, the canoe lore, the construction, the history, and so on and so forth. And what really started me on this journey, when I was 12 years old, I was given this book, which is Paddle to the Sea, famous book, uh, Hauling, Clancy Hauling, about a, a little Native American boy who lived up in um, North uh, Lake Superior. He whittled a little boat, threw it in the river, floated to the Atlantic Ocean. It's really quite a story, but ever since I read that uh, book, I've been a nut about um, canoes. But what I would like to look at tonight is how uh, the role uh, canoes played in the settling and the commerce, and then later the recreation of uh, North America. It is an immense subject. There's a lot that um, I just won't be able to go over to, like there is the Polynesian tradition or Hawaiian tra tradition of um, canoes that is, uh, you know, just in a whole nother universe. And on the Pacific Northwest, of course, they developed uh, canoes, uh, dugouts to a high art. And what we're mostly going to deal with are uh, starting here in the East and how the um, canoes help really open up uh, North America. Now, just the other day, I was reading about um, the history of Conway, and I came across the fact that in 1642, Darby Field, who was an Irishman from um, uh, Portsmouth, um, it was, is most famous for being the first person to climb Mount Washington. But he also, um, in describing this trip, described how he traveled up the Saco River by canoe and um, traveling through what, what is now Freiburg to Conway, which are about eight miles apart. He said it was one large native village along the river because, of course, that's all um, river valley bottomland and really good, uh, you know, place to grow their corn and their squash and so on. And um, it's really interesting I mean, to, for those who know the area to think that um, this is the way everybody got around by canoe, uh, but. Uh, and that how the Conway, and um, which is now, you know, um, roads, bridges, buildings, but there was one big native village all the way over to Freiburg. Really kind of interesting. So I'm going to um, start with uh, some slides here. And let's see. Let's get... Okay. Okay, our first picture illustrates a classic uh, uh, birch bark canoe. And this may well have been very similar to the boat that um, Darby Field traveled in. Uh, the the, the uh, natives of uh, North America developed these boats into high art. Uh, there was a, they had a very sophisticated tradition going and uh, they were a unique craft in that they, a boat like this could carry a thousand pounds, but it also uh, could be, might weigh 60 or 70 pounds, could be easily carried around rapids or obstructions. And 
uh, they also, you know, are well suited for traveling up a river as well as down a river. Uh, I mean, everybody floats down river, but uh, I have found that I really enjoy traveling up river uh, using a pole and then doing a technique called tracking where you tie a line onto the bow and the stern of the boat, you walk along and uh, pull your boat up with you. You keep the bow pointed out into the current so it holds the, to the uh, line taut. And as such, you can steer it around obstructions. I even had uh, new people in Alaska who would sit in the back of the canoe and have their dog, their sled dog rigged up to the, uh, the boat and they would run along shore and pull the boat up while they sat in the stern of the boat and steered. But it takes a pretty good dog to be able to do that. Now, this is a really interesting map here because the, the pinkish color is the range of the uh, white birch or canoe birch or paper birch. And you can see it cuts diagonally right across North America. Coincident with the range of the paper birch is this chain of lakes that starts with the St. Lawrence River, goes through the Great Lakes, and then they head no, northwest to Lake Winnipeg. And there's a series of bridges you can make until you get into a flowage that eventually leads to the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and it's a really remarkable how that the canoe birch, which of course is the perfect uh, material for building a bark canoe, um, runs along this, this um, expanse of water. Now this is a little uh, bigger detail showing how the trade route was established into Canada. Now they would start in Montreal and uh, going up river from Montreal, uh, they would go up to St. Lawrence and then they would take the Ottawa River and uh, ascend the Ottawa River. And then they would make a little cut off the Lake Nipissing and come out in Georgian Bay. And then they would paddle up through the Sioux, skirt the perimeter of uh, Lake Superior, and then um, make at what was called the Grand Portage, make a 12 mile carry that would put them in a flowage that would lead them to Lake Winnipeg. And they could make from Montreal to Lake Winnipeg, when this was used as a trade route, they could make that uh, distance in about uh, the one year to get all before from freeze up to freeze up. Now this next picture shows uh, more trade routes well down in the United States. Uh, and you can see we have, uh, you know, the Mississippi and um, all the different rivers, the Ohio River, all interconnected. And for instance, something that a lot of people aren't aware of is that Chicago is on the map because that's, or was, was the city was started there because that is the portage between um, the Great Lakes and I, I'm not sure what river it is right there, but it, it gets you into the Mississippi. So that's a major portage right now. Uh, right there. Now, now that's all connected, of course, by canals and stuff. But you can see, again, <laughs> most of the uh, canoe routes are along that band that our first map showed us of where the paper birch existed or grew. Now, the beauty, of course, of the, the birch tree, the birch bark canoe, is that to build a boat, all you needed was an ax, a knife, and, and an awl, 
and what's called a crooked knife that allows you to, to is something it's a knife that you hold and pull it towards you but you really didn't need much more than that and so they could um be right out in the middle of nowhere and if they damaged their boat as one explorer said they the, the guide would go into what he called the closet of the woods and take out the material he needed or find the material he needed to make um, the repairs necessary. Now this is a picture taken along the French River, which was part of the route between um, uh, Ottawa and Georgian Bay. And uh, this is a local native family, and it just shows, uh, this picture was taken about 1907, uh, just a big canoe, but you can see there, everybody's right at home in it, and I don't know if you can see it, but the fellow sitting right in the stern is holding a little baby <laughs> out for the tour. And here is a shot taken in the 19th century of a, a spot that they chose to build canoes. And as I said, um, they had a very sophisticated um, technology and, uh, and it, it all figured out. And what they basically did is they would find a, a, a beach or a soft ground and they would drive stakes into the ground <clears throat> that kind of outline the shape of the boat, and then they would take the pieces of birch bark that had been sewn together with um, roots, and they would kind of fold it into these stakes like you would an envelope. Then they would put split um, uh, cedar or spruce planking down and then put the ribs in and you can see a few ribs on the ground there that would get bent in and then the gunnels would put on, be put on and um, they could, um, you know, crank a boat out. I think they said it took about a week um, to make one to somebody's real experience. And there are people who do this and um, are still doing it even right here in New Hampshire. There's a couple of birch bark builders here. And here is a picture of the so-called Voyager canoes. And these boats, um, Montreal was their base. And they took off as, you know, to follow a lot of the routes on the map. And this is, um, that route that I showed you that went diagonally across Canada was really the equivalent of, let's say the Oregon Trail uh, to Canada. Um, insofar as allowed the settling and the opening up of the West and so on. Uh, these Voyager boats were uh, 36 feet long, carried a huge load of gear. And you will notice in this picture that uh, the, the sternman has a long paddle that's very, very narrow. All their paddles tended to have very narrow blades uh, because this is the most efficient shape when you're um, paddling a heavily laden boat day in, day out. And they would paddle 14, 16 hours a day. Okay. Now this just shows uh, the so-called Voyager canoe and its kit. Um, and the barrels uh, were 100 pound barrels of either salt pork or flour or some other kind of food. And all the bales that you see on the right uh, next to the hull of the boat were called pieces. And each piece weighed 90 pounds. And what they were, were uh, furs or trade goods. If they were trade goods, they were pre-packaged and, and uh, so that they were waterproof uh, and they just ha didn't have to worry about that. But if they were um, furs, they put 
were put in a, what's called a fur press that would smush them down really tight and then they were packaged. But the standard weight was 90 pounds. Now, when they came to a portage, each voyager carried 90, uh, two 90 pound packs at a time, so 180 pounds. He was responsible for six all together. Um, and so when he went over the portage, the, the routine was 10 minutes of carry or a half mile stop, return, pick up two more pieces or packs, carry a half mile, stop, return, pick up two more packs, carry a half mile, continue to the end of portage. Sounds like a great way to spend your holiday. Uh, and you can see some of the other accoutrements of um, the voyagers in that they had a, a couple of kettles there to cook their grub, uh, lengths of rope. Um, the uh, yellow things right in the foreground were sponges for sponging out the boat. And on the right side of the picture, those bundles, I believe, are all the voyagers' um, personal gear. And they were just allowed a small knapsack with, um, I don't know what, but I don't think they carried a lot of stuff. Maybe a blanket and an extra shirt or some rain gear, but they were pretty hardcore. Okay. So the Voyager canoes started to die out when, um, you know, uh, roads were being built, settlements were established, and particularly power came on. And uh, the birch bark canoe was used some recreationally, but in the late um, 1860s, 1870s, um, people started building various types of boats. And uh, in, in Canada and Ontario, there was a lot of building going on with what you call three board canoes and cedar strip canoes that were uh, made of all wood. And in the United States, there was a lot of experimenting and building going on, um, particularly in upstate New York. Um, in Maine, uh, there, uh, birch bark canoes were used. Uh, and that's another, uh, I'll go into that in a minute here, but I just wanted to focus here on what was going on in upstate New York. So after the American Civil War, there was a, a major, let's say, uh, change in American society where um, people were uh, realizing uh, that they had something called leisure time and they wanted to recreate and they were looking for something to do. Um, before uh, this time, when people went out in the woods, they were either hunters or trappers or voyagers or explorers or something like that. Uh, the only uh, people that went out to recreate were the very uh, wealthy who usually hired a guide. The average person just didn't go out in the woods. So in um, the 1870s, people wanted to recreate more and various builders were building various boats. And there was a uh, boat builder up in upstate New York called Henry Rushton, who was called the Stradivarius of canoe building. And one day a fellow comes to him whose uh, name was George Washington Sears. Also his pen name was Nesmuk and said to Rushton, uh, can you build me the lightest boat possible? Nesmuk was hardly five foot tall, weighed 110 pounds, and he was in the uh, beginning stages of tuberculosis. So he didn't have a lot of, let's say, oomph. So Rushton built him this boat that you're looking at here, and um, which 
turned out to be very successful. It's nine feet long and it weighs 10 and a half pounds. Um, the boat is built with white cedar planking and oak ribs. Uh, Nesmuk took it on a 300 mile journey and wrote a story about it that was published in uh, a magazine called Forest and Stream, which was the sporting journal of the day with a national distributorship. And uh, I believe in the early 1880s, the canoeing became the rage in America. It was called the golden age of canoeing, but it all started with uh, Nesmuk uh, going on the cr cruise, taking the, what they call the cruise, and the name of the boat was the Sari Gamp. Sari Gamp was a character um, in a Dickens, no a Charles Dickens novel, who was evidently a, an alcoholic, and she uh, evidently uh, took no water. So um, Nesbuck, you know, as a play on words, named his boat the Sari Gamp uh, because he hoped it would take no water. But um, his his book is still in print today. His, his name is Woodcraft, but it's really quite an interesting read. But Nesmuk was very interesting in, let's say, uh, making canoeing accessible to families and people who wanted to recreate because he often uh, went alone and uh, just showed people that he could do it through his writings. Now, the interesting thing is that Nesmuk's whole outfit which consisted of a tent, backpack with a change of clothes, cooking utensils, a couple days worth of food, and his boat weighed 22 pounds. And so I think we, we think we, we've actually reinvented the wheel with all of our, you know, super light this, that, and the other thing. But Nesbuk had an incredibly light outfit, and he's worth studying insofar as um, how to go in the woods and travel and be really comfortable without much gear. Now, Nesmuk also, or excuse me, Rushton also built a slightly larger boat for people who are a little bigger than 110 pounds. And this is called the Wee Lassie. The Wee Lassie is 10 and a half feet long and weighs about 22 pounds but also all wood construction, uh, lap strake. And in, I've uh, built, oh, a couple, probably a couple of dozen of these boats. And I find for somebody of me, of my size, who I'm just, let's say north of 200 pounds, um, this boat will carry me very nicely, as long as it's relatively calm, but it's a little bit small, for you know, camping gear and and et cetera. It's just it's it, it's as small a boat as I can safely paddle, but but it's ten and a half feet long and weighs uh to about 22, 23 pounds, um, and so on. But anyway, uh Rushton, of course, his business boomed, but there were other builders in the era who all you know got on the say the mounting wave and uh canoeing as i mentioned really became the rage in new york now this is another rushton boat and these boats were called the poor man's yachts uh but this had a tent in it and the idea being that when you wanted to go to sleep you know why bother pitching the tent up on the shore you just tied up somewhere and and put your canoe tent up and slept in the boat. Uh, this boat actually had a deck on it with a cockpit, uh, but it looks like, you know, you could be quite comfortable as long as you weren't, let's say, uh, claustrophobic. There was just another shot of the same boat. It was taken in the Adirondack Museum, and you can see that he, he's even carrying a rifle in there for who knows what. But People really got into it. Um, 
But this type of boat, the all wood boats, um, tended to be very labor intensive to build. And they were still, for what they were, they were not inexpensive. Here's another boat of Rushton's. This is called the Vesper. This was a 16 foot decked sailing canoe and it's kind of the ultimate insofar as the sophistication and the develop, development of the form. And this particular boat, um, I believe it was in 1884, won the world championship for canoe sail racing. It has on it what you call bat wing sails and uh, just all kinds of what you call boat jewelry, which are nickel plated uh, brass uh, fittings on it. And it's really was a sight to hold. A, a, a boat like this, um, I cannot even begin to think how much it would cost today just because of all the handwork, but you can see it's decked. And so people, you know, develop these into very sophisticated craft. Okay. But then um, in the late latter part of the 19th century in Maine, people started taking the uh, birch bark canoe and covering the outside with canvas. The, the, the one factor that led ultimately to the demise of the birch bark canoe was the inability to get birch bark in sheets big enough to cover the boat. Um, they, uh, you know, took a really big tree and were just really hard to find. And I, I know a couple of contemporary builders and they say they just have to look high and low and it's really hard to find um, the necessary wood. Uh, so with the wood canvas boat, you, you, the boat would be built upside down and then you had a canvas that was stretched over it and the canvas was painted to be waterproof. And it makes quite a good boat, quite tough, uh, but they tend to be heavier than the all wood boats. Uh, the, 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 the boats like the, um, you know, the, the uh, Wee Lassie, you know, that class of comparing them same size boats, a wood canvas and all wood boat, the uh, all wood boats would tend to be about 15% um, lighter, but they also uh, were two or three times more expensive because of the labor involved to do all the watertight joinery. This type of boat, you, the, it didn't matter how close the planks were because you covered it with canvas and you painted it. And as I said, that's what made it watertight. Okay, and then, and then it just as a further revolution, um, this was a boat that was developed uh, for use on the Charles River outside of you know Boston and uh, it was used for what they called girling which was to take your date um, with um, you know your picnic lunch and a Victrola and go canoeing on the Ch Charles and you can see they had very long decks they're not necessarily that practical because the long decks made a boat that was um, hard to maintain and uh, also added a lot of weight. They're, they're, you'd often get rot up in that enclosed space, but they look really, really nice. But uh, there are a lot of people who really like these boats because they're very beautiful, but there's a, a lot of similitude in a boat like this and a birch bark canoe in the basic construction so far as it's plank and it's rib in a fashion very similar to a birch bark canoe, but the covering is just covered with uh, is canvas. Okay, and here we have a shot 
of uh, our more um, contemporary birch bark, oh, excuse me, uh, wood canvas boats at one of our gatherings. Wooden Canoe is who Annie works for. It's a, an association of, let's say, Wooden Canoe Nuts, uh, which I'm a big one. But um, there's a number of people building wood canvas boats. It's, um, uh, they just really enjoy them for their aesthetic value and with a little bit of care and um, maintenance, they will last. Uh, many of them are over a hundred years old. Um, when you start to use a boat like this, you know, you just don't look, go looking for big rocks to wham it into. You learn to be a good canoeist and so far as controlling your boat. And they are very, very practical because, you know, as I, uh, said earlier, basically wood canoes settled North America, at least Northern North America. They traveled all across the continent. Um, and these, uh, the wood canvas boats lend them, lend themselves a little bit more to, let's say, uh, a factory production. They're a little bit um, less demanding to build than an all wood boat. So they're more popular, and as I mentioned, mentioned um, they're more economical. Now, a couple of things that um, I had mentioned a little bit before. Uh, first of all, the, the amazing um, coincidence of how the um, birch grew across Canada where uh, it was needed the most insofar as um, the, the canoe routes were concerned. And um, the, the other uh, really big factor was that um, with uh, Rushton's work and other builders, they could get these incredibly light boats through using Northern White Cedar. And Northern White Cedar is like the perfect canoe material um, in that it's very strong, it's very light, it's very ductile, and um, it is just really the perfect material. So I guess we can go on to break, uh, to, to um, questions now, but I want to take a break just for a second. I'll be right back. And you can get me on for questions. I'll okay. Break. Hello. Hi, Annie. We could go um, away from the screen share if you want and get it where everybody can be seen. Yeah. There you go. I will there. Great. Um, so yeah, Jeffrey's just taking a quick little bathroom break and he'll be right back. So I'm going to get it uh, so you can see everybody. Good. Yeah, does anyone? So, thank you for your patience. Hi, Amy. Hi, Annie. David and Cece over here, nearby. Yes. <laughs> Fun. Okay, there you go. You can see people. Okay. Uh, does anybody have any questions or? comments or curious about anything? Anne, you could, um, Anne, go ahead if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, I forgot I left it muted because my dog. Um, I, I was wondering um, when you said <laughs> <laughs> the canvas boats are so much heavier, were the wooden boats finished with anything or were they uh, just left to swell and uh, you know, be the that light. Boats, the all wood boats. Yeah. yeah, they were finished with varnish and paint. Oh, okay. But so they would not lighter. necessarily soak up that much water. Okay. And the other thing I wanted to comment on is uh, one of the Rushton boats that you called a canoe. It looked a lot like the Adirondack rowing boats too. Yeah. Right. 
It's the well, same Rushton, shape. Yeah. Um, there is actually, um, over in the Adirondacks, there are a lot of people still building guide boats. And it's, a, it's another, uh, you know, let's say, very strong tradition. And they've actually made a list of what separates a guide boat from a canoe. Okay. Because they hate it when you call a guide boat a canoe and vice versa. Yeah. Um, but it was developed. It's very uh, light, very strong, but it's designed to be rowed. And as somebody once said, um, no explorer likes to back in the new country. Canoeists always face forward, which, which I find, you know, just personally, I enjoy more than, than going backwards. I mean, rowing is great, great sport and everything, but the guide boats were used mostly on established routes and the, the sport or the um, client would sit in the stern of the boat and they would see what was going on. The guide sat in the bow. Okay. Facing backwards. I can see the distinction now, yeah. Yeah, but they were pretty amazing boats. I mean, they're also very highly developed, highly sophisticated. Um, they were once described as being perhaps the most sophisticated product of American folk craftsmanship wow. because of uh, the hours that go in. I mean, to build a traditional guide boat now, it's over 500 hours, very labor intensive. Okay, anybody else have any more questions or comments? I, I have a quick question about the stability of those, that 10 pound canoe. Uh-huh. How stable was it when you were canoeing? Would you fly out a lot or not? Well, um, that boat, I think, you know, the, the beam is only like 24 inches. And they used to say, you know, if you had long hair, you had to part it in the middle. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. but on the other hand, um, like Nesmuk, um, most, a lot of those boats were uh, used with a double paddle. Wood canvas boats tend to be used with a single paddle, but a lot of the uh, of Russians boats, double paddle, and they were sitting on the floor of the boat. So your center of gravity is lower, but uh, it's the kind of boat, if you tried you know, sitting up high, you would immediately wind up in the water. But if you sat on the floor of the boat, it's like sitting up high in a kayak. It's it very, very tippy. But if you sit on the floor of the boat, you're a lot better off. Yeah. And, and I also have a, a comment. So back in 1972, I moved up here and I wanted to get a canoe. And I looked around. I went to a regular boat shop. And I said, you have any canoes? He said, no. I said, oh, wait a minute. I got one in the back. But it doesn't have any seats, you know. And he showed it to me. as an old town canoe. And he sold it to me for $100. And we went and checked on it. It because you can, they're registered, you know, so you go to Old Town, it was built in 1932 for a, a camp up here. Okay. And the reason, at 16 feet, and the reason why it doesn't have any seats, it just had the bars, because I think when they were teaching them how to canoe, they taught them to kneel and just put their butt on the bars. Yeah. Yeah. And okay. And we still have it, you know, it's just this it's beautiful, beautiful piece of work. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's when when you canoe in that, you know, it just moves real slowly. It doesn't make any noise. I mean, real fast. It doesn't make any noise. It's just a yeah, a, an amazing craftsmanship. Yeah. Good question, Jeff. Sure. Well, first, let me make a comment about the seatless canoes. Um, the the uh, I've often heard them called Boy Scout canoes because the scouts bought many of them and 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 supposedly they bought them without seats for that very reason, um, better for learning, so. Uh -huh. But Jeff, the question is, um, since guideboats came up, I've heard or read people uh, saying that uh, the Rushton Saranac Laker is not a real guideboat. So I know that you've worked on uh, probably both types, uh, Rushtons and, and ones from the Adirondack region. What is uh, the basis of that? And, and do you see that they're really different in any particular way? Well, um, 
if you get into the, let's say, the elite of the guide boats, um, the Russian boat was considered to be a little bit, let's say, loggy. I mean, there were, there were dozens of different varieties and every lake had its own, um, let's say, development of a guide boat or interpretation. Um, and some boats were known for their stability, some were known for their capacity, and some were known for their speed. And I think the Rushton boat was um, known for its capacity and its stability, but not its speed. And um, the guiding business was very competitive, and the guys who had the fastest boats got the most business. So that might have done it. But the other thing is, I know that Russian also built some of his guide boats with steam bent ribs versus sawn frames, which is a no no. The, the um, distinguishing characteristics are a of a guide boat are it's double ended like a canoe, it has what, what in the Adirondacks they call a bottom board, the rest of the universe calls it a keel, it has sawn frames, and it's smooth skin or basically how you define a guide and, and lightweight. But um, I think I've heard the same thing about the Russian guide boat, but there's, it's, um, I think in some ways it's kind of splitting hairs. I mean, unless you can, he did make some of his guide boats with steam bent ribs, which would um, not necessarily be any, any weaker or any deficit in construction, it's more, it's a faster way to, and a cheaper way to build the boat because his lightest boats, like the Sari Gamp, had steam bent ribs in her. So, would have if you could find any you know any literature on that, I'd be interested in seeing that. But it, I think it all comes down to kind of like a, a pedigree thing. Okay. Good. Thank you. Sure. Anybody else with any more questions? Or, yes. I was just really interested in the history that you showed because we lived and worked in Minnesota for 18 uh -huh. years, which is why a New Hampshire winter doesn't phase us at all. And our kids grew up there. And one of the things if you live in Minnesota is learning how to canoe and learning to really canoe in primitive places. Both of them ended up taking trips in the boundary waters, and I won't go into detail, but they basically, a lot of them traced some of the old voyageurs routes. And my son actually went into, from the Blood Rain River into Winnipeg. Uh -huh. and his final trip was started in the middle of Ontario and went to Hudson Bay. And wow. those, those trips were formative experiences for my kids. They can still get in a canoe and just take off. They have no problem. Yeah. Well, um, I'm really glad you brought this up because when I was in my 20s, I was living in Alaska. And for um, a number of years, every summer I took off, I had a 17 foot old town and I would um, get dropped off at the head of some big river with my canoe, axe, rifle, tent, and sleeping bag, and maybe 600 pounds of gear of food. And I would be off the road from anywhere from one to three months, just canoeing, exploring. And I found that um, the 20th century just kind of went away. I had no phone, no mail, no bills no electronic this. The only thing that clued you into the 20th century was you'd see the, you know, contrails of the jets flying high. And I've never been the same since. Anybody who knows me will understand that. Because one thing it did was it really showed how um, we're such a, uh, let's say a, a motor society and to go months with no motor, just paddle, you know, paddle speed, um, it really changes your perspective. And people have said that 
I took my retirement in my 20s because I had, uh, I had a job that allowed me to work. Um, it was very flexible and I could take the whole summer off and go on these adventures. And um, I did one trip, it was almost a thousand miles that we covered. And it was just, it was really, really wonderful. Really, really wonderful. There, there was something that when you go out for an extended trip like that, you get into a different rhythm. There's what you, they call the rhythm of the trail. It's not what's going on on your watch, but you just, it's a whole different thing. And I really, really enjoyed it. It's something I think I would encourage everybody. It sounds like your kids also got a taste of that too. I have just one more quick comment. When you talked about what the Voyagers carried with them, by the time Stephen took his most advanced trip, he had a waterproof duffel bag that was literally 18 or 20 inches long. And he, I watched him pack, he was 16, so I couldn't tell him what to do. And he was taking three t-shirts. And I said, Stephen, you're going for six weeks and you're taking three t-shirts. And he said, mom, one's for the day, one's for the night, and one's to come home in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can watch it if you want, but you might not want to. Why? <laughs> Why? Right. Right. No, but canoeing is just a wonderful sport like that. And one of the wonderful things about New England is there is so much canoeable water here and um, just so many routes you can do. Like there is this um, Northern Forest Canoe Trail, you know, goes from Old Forge, New York, up to Northern Maine. And just right in our sock, our, our valley here, we have the Saco River, which is an amazing river for canoeing. I mean, it's heavily used, but it's a beautiful, beautiful river. In fact, I just read that um, the Saco is considered to be the most beautiful canoeing river in the East because you can canoe down it and get views of the presidentials. And it's a remarkable <clears throat> river. So, okay, any, any more um, comments or, yes. One more. I'm wondering if you ever heard of uh, a project called the Six Hour Canoe. <laughs> yeah, I yeah. have, I've seen them built. Yeah, we used yeah. to do them with seventh graders. Uh, you know, we didn't have industrial arts or anything. So um, one spring, the daughter of one of the authors of that book was on our staff and uh, about five teachers decided we wanted to embark on this for spring semester uh, with our seventh graders. So we spent our spring vacation building our own to make sure we knew what we were doing. And uh -huh. we kept this going. We kept those seventh graders in teams of about four and five made those, but it didn't, it took more than six hours because we had 50 minute classes and it took 10 minutes to set up and it took 10 minutes to clean up. So it was a little right. difficult, but uh, they're great, great little simple boats. They don't look like a traditional canoe. They're not rounded. Uh, they're built with marine plywood that you know, come together and uh, yeah. a simple plan for the um, bottom with a, a simple um, tie. It, 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 they were really fun to build, though. The kids really enjoyed it, and they had races at the end of the year, so it was a lot of fun. Uh-huh. Um, well, that's um, really good you brought that up because um, there's a whole um, organization now going to the United States that focuses on um, building boats with kids. And it got started by this fellow named Joe Yucha, who uh, started it down at the Alexandra Seaport, which is outside of Washington. And he would take um, youth at risk, put them through a two year program where he would just work them really hard building boats and um, including a lot of canoes. And at the end of two years, they would get a high school diploma and an apprentice card for the Carpenters Union, which is a really remarkable program. But this has since spread to all over the United States now as a vehicle for working with kids because in boat building, there's a lot of math 
And so, you, you know, you gotta do that. There's a, um, I mean, it takes care of three important realms. One is the intellect and so far as the math and the engineering and thinking about all that. The one, other one is aesthetic uh, discernment, you know, because there's a saying in boat building, what looks right is right. And a lot of these boats are built by eye. And the third one is developing a manual skills because any of these thing, any, you know, work in wood and particularly work in boats uh, are, are, it's really the pinnacle of the woodworker's art. Um, I mean, and you really have to develop your manual skills for that. So they found that it's a really good vehicle for working with kids, you know, because they you, there's so much they can learn instead of just sitting in front of a, a computer screen. So I'm a great I'm a great advocate of that. Hey, I have a quick question: um, Is Mississippi River canoeable nowadays? Excuse me. Is Mississippi River uh, canoeable? You, can you canoe on it? I, I would think you could. I mean, you have competition from barges and all that, but I still hear of people um, going down uh, the Mississippi. I mean, you, I'm sure there's, you can get information on that, but, you know, uh, I've heard of people like starting in Chicago and going over, I think it's the Illinois River, they take down into the Missouri, into the Mississippi. So, but I'm sure that you could find information about that. Why are you thinking of doing it? Uh, I'm thinking of doing it. I mean, you think of, you know, Tom Sawyer and Huck Finn, you think people going down Mississippi, there's Mississippi yeah. River Road, uh, but we also tried to go the lengths of uh, Squam on a canoe and it was a little unnerving because of all the wakes from the boats. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a problem. In some parts of the Mississippi, I know have been channelized, so there's not a lot of places to hide, but I'm sure that there are accounts out there that you could find with a little bit of research. And it sounds like a great thing to do. It seems like it'd be fun, doesn't it? You can, you can look for a book by a na man named Peter Lowry from Middlebury, Vermont. L O. Yeah. I, I think it's L-O-U-R-I-E. Yeah. Thank he you. did a lot of canoe trips all around the world. And that's that was one of them, I believe. Well, maybe he went there. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. So the Mississippi yes. River starts in Minnesota at Lake Itasca. Right. And you can go down. There's a series of 252 locks with number one somewhere above Minneapolis, number two, three, four, and five are in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and then so forth. So you certainly could start through Minnesota and go into Iowa and so forth. And of course, if you traced Huck Finn's route, the, the demise of their mission was at Cairo, which is in Illinois, because they misread the signals and they got all the way to St. Louis. So, I mean, I would do the research that our, our host is telling us about, because you certainly could do part of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, there's a lot of really interesting trips. <laughs> like, just for another one, you can go over to Lake Champlain, go out of the north end of it down the Rideau River or the Rideau Canal, goes into the St. Lawrence, and then you can go um, up, the St. Lawrence all the way um, into um, Lake Ontario and down Lake Ontario to Buffalo. And then in Buffalo, you can pick up the Erie Canal and you can paddle that all the way back across New York to Albany. And then there's a, a connector that takes you uh, with a couple of locks over back to Lake Champlain. I mean, that's just one example. And then um, the province of Ontario is covered with canals. There's what's called the Trent Canal System. And you could spend the rest of your life up there on those canals. And, you know, a lot of people do it with power boats and stuff, but 
it's all very canoeable. Um, there's lots of trips to do in Maine, and um, the Adirondacks were at one point called the Venice of North America because there's so many interconnecting waterways. The Adirondacks are really quite remarkable like that, and a lot of them you can still use. You haven't talked much about sort of backcountry canoeing, you know, like Tyne and I a million years ago, we were one of the first people when Kedjim Kujik National Park opened in Nova Scotia. In Nova Scotia. We canoed. Uh -huh. We were out there for seven days and didn't see another person. We didn't know what we were doing. We're lucky we didn't get killed, actually. But but there's uh, so many different places like that where you can go lake to lake to lake to lake, you know. Especially yeah. in Canada and like Diana was saying, up in the boundary waters in Minnesota, places like that. And it's hard work, you know, because you got really got to carry everything, but not right. not 180 pounds. <laughs> right, right. Well, you know, the thing about the voyagers, they, frankly, they died like flies. And the two things that killed them were drowning, because I guess none of them could swim, but, and the other was strangulated hernia just from carrying too much weight. So it was a pretty rugged life. I mean, it's been romanticized tremendously, but it was really, really a rough way to live, rough way to make a living. Uh, any more questions? No, there's another nice little loop canoe trip you can do over in Maine. I assume you can still do it where you can park in Jackman, Maine and go out on Holub Pond and then you just, you circle through Addian Lake and, and whatnot and go down the Moose River, but that somehow you end up paddling back to Jackman. It's not, not a common thing to find something you can make a loop out of, but yeah. Uh, yeah. we did that in, uh, as a five day trip, I think. Yeah, yeah. That's, a no, that's a really nice trip. I did it actually myself years and years ago. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, this has certainly been interesting. It's the first time I've done a Zoom presentation like this. And forgive me if I was a little bit, let's say, rusty. Um, but uh, I'm glad to talk canoes anytime. And, you know, we can talk about all kinds of stuff, politics as well. But um, canoes is, uh, I've been, you know, really involved in the in the craft for many years and it's been very much a way of life for me and I feel very lucky. One of the wonderful things about living in this part of the world as I mentioned before is that we have wonderful wonderful wood here and it's really exceptional and it's just a pleasure to build because just about all my wood is local and we're very blessed like that. But um, anyway, um, Amy, thank you for sponsoring this and putting this together. And um, thank you, Jeff. We really me if you have any questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much. If thank anyone you. else has questions, you know where to find Jeff, right? <laughs>